Good evening. My name's Brendan Sargent. I'm the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, recently appointed. Uh, tonight we have the annual the Des Paul Lecture. Des was one of the uh, heads of the, one of my predecessors, and the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, and a very distinguished person he was, uh, and his work still reverberates uh, in academic and policy communities. Tonight we have Professor Bruce Gentleson. And he's visiting the ANU as the 2020 Des Ball Chair at the SDSC. And we're very lucky to have him. He's the William Preston Few Professor of Public Policy and Professor of Political Science at Duke University. He's also a Global Fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Centre for Scholars and non-resident senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He served in a number of US foreign policy positions, most recently as senior advisor to the State Department Policy Planning Director and chair of Hillary Clinton 2016 Foreign Policy Working Group. In 2015-16, he was the Henry A. Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and International Relations at the John <coughs> W. Klug Center Library of Congress. He received the 2018 American Political Science Association International Security Section Joseph J. Cruzel Award for Distinguished Public Service. He is co-director of the Bridging the Gap Project promoting greater policy relevance among academics. He holds a PhD from Cornell. He's written many books and articles, and his most recent book, and I think it's a book for our times, The Peacemakers, Leadership Lessons from the 20th Century. It's a real pleasure and privilege to have him undertake the Des Ball lecture tonight. And <clears throat> his topic is American foreign policy on 2020 presidential election. I'm intrigued to see how he handles that topic because it seems to be changing by the minute. <laughs> anyway, so welcome, Professor. Thank you. So thanks to um, uh, Brendan Sargent for the kind introduction uh, and indeed for the invitation from my colleagues here, from Brendan, from Professor Evelyn Gao and others who uh, extended the invitation to come as the Des Ball Visiting Chair. Um, we've been here for go going on a month now, and it's been a fascinating time to be in Australia, not only conversations with colleagues, um, uh, some officials I've learned to say across the lake uh, that I've spent some time with, getting into the local jargon, um, and, um, um, and also just the whole being here for the last month and having some sense of what you all have gone through in terms of the bushfires and the hailstorms and everything. And um, you know, now, of course, we're all dealing here and, and back in the United States and elsewhere with the coronavirus. Um, but it's been a great opportunity for me to be here. Uh, and, and people have been very gracious. I also did have the, uh, the opportunity to, to know Des Ball uh, when he was an eminent academic and early in my career when I was a graduate student. and. Um, younger professor and read his work and met him at a number of conferences. So it's been a real privilege to, uh, to have this opportunity to be here and to have this designation as the Des Ball Chair and the, and the lecture. A um, couple of comments to start. First of all, in terms of transparency, uh, as Brendan said, um, I have served in democratic policy positions in the Obama administration, uh, in the Bill Clinton-Al Gore administration. I've been an advisor to democratic candidates in the Clinton campaign. There are many working groups. I was the chair of the Foreign Policy Advisory Group dealing with Syria and some other Middle East issues. Um, so I want to be transparent about that. Um, and uh, you can probably surmise my views of the current president and administration. Um, uh, but I really want to talk with my professor hat on analytically. You'd be the judge of how well I do that. Uh, but to try to give a sense for what the politics are and what the policy debates are. And none of us are tabula rasa, so that won't leak through. But I'm not really here you know, to, to necessarily, um, you know, make the case for a particular, particular candidate. Uh, so I really want to try to address four questions, and I really want to leave time for 
I'm guessing, given that we're operating in real time here, right, uh, that people will have questions or comments. Um, so the four questions I want to address are, first of all, does foreign policy matter in American presidential elections? Look a little bit about our historical experience in recent years. Uh, secondly, what are the key 2020 foreign policy issues? And third, kind of digging deeper, you know, what are the political dynamics that are not just about Donald Trump, that were percolating before him, that would have been there even if Hillary Clinton had won, and they'll be there whoever wins in 2020? Uh, and then fourth, how is this affecting the debate about the global role American foreign policy plays in this third decade of the 21st century? And with apologies, I'm going to, you know, not, you know, I, I'm going to lay out some points w and rather than fully develop them in the interest of time. We can come back to them either for more elaboration or for challenges or questions that you have. Um, so let me start with this issue of does foreign policy, like why should we be talking about this tonight? Does foreign policy matter in the 2020 election? There's no illusion that foreign policy is going to matter more than domestic policy and related issues. Did the only times, say, in the post-1945 history that foreign policy has been a really major issue in American presidential elections were during wars, Korea in 1952, where Dwight Eisenhower promised to bring the troops home, uh, building on his role uh, in World War II as, as Allied commander, and in Vietnam in 1972 in the middle of the war in the Nixon-McGovern debate. And the polling showed that foreign policy really mattered heavily in those elections. In fact, in a number of elections, the candidate weaker on foreign policy has actually won. 1976, Jimmy Carter against Gerald Ford. Um, 1992, Bill Clinton an Arkansas governor against George H.W. Bush, who had led the effort in the first Persian Gulf War uh, to get Iraq out of, out of Kuwait and keep it out of Saudi Arabia, and who had been there when the Berlin Wall came down. Um, in 2000, uh, my old boss, Vice President Al Gore, who I did a lot of work for over the years throughout his career and in his campaign, uh, who had a much stronger foreign policy record than, than George W. Bush, governor of Texas, lost. Um, 2008, Barack Obama and John McCain. Uh, and Obama won. And in fact, foreign policy was actually a significant issue in 2008 in the Barack Obama Hillary Clinton primary because her vote on the Iraq War was a crucial factor that led to Obama's victory in the, in, in the primary. And in 2016, Donald Trump against Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. In fact, you know, when Hillary Clinton ran, you know, she chose to run as Secretary Clinton, not as Senator Clinton. And that was a very conscious effort to demonstrate that she had that experience. So we've seen the weaker foreign policy candidate lose, uh, sorry, win in a lot of elections. But to say that foreign policy is electorally less important than domestic policy is not to say that it's unimportant, and two points in that regard. One is pollsters often ask the question about leadership. Who do you think will be a stronger leader uh, in, for the United States as president? And when they ask the follow-up question, how do you measure leadership, People often point to foreign policy and national security there. So it's sort of a hidden effect within the leadership question, even when the question of which issue matters to you gets foreign policy lower than, than other issues. And secondly, even in a, in a close election, even if 5% of the electorate say that foreign policy matters to them in their vote, well, I'll go back to 2016. Donald Trump won by less than 1% in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania one by 1.2% in Florida. So of course it's not important as health care, jobs, but it matters in those respects, even when it's not an election like 1952 uh, or 1972. So what are the key 2020 foreign policy issues? And here I kind of want to get at the paradox that I think is out there. On the one hand, President Trump's foreign policy approval rating has never been higher than 43.5%. Indeed, if you break that down by party, only 12% of Democrats approve, no surprise. 86% Republican, of Republicans approve, no surprise. And only 37% of independents approve, right? So you would say, okay, this is a fairly you know, weak foreign policy record. And on many issues, uh, support for NATO, which was 53% before Trump was president, had gone up to 62%. Uh, support for the Paris Climate Accord uh, had gone up from 62 to 68%. Support for the Iran nuclear nonproliferation agreement had gone up from 60 to 66 percent, right? So that's on the one hand. But what is Trump's appeal? And I would say it comes across in three respects. 
One is what political scientists call voting salience, where it's not so much what those overall polls, like I started to tell you, but it's really for those people who hold a foreign policy opinion, how likely is it to be a factor in how they vote? The intensity of views. So you see this, for example, on trade, and you've seen it for a long time. On the one hand, recent polls on whether trade was good for the American economy had gone up from 59% in 2016 to 82% in 2019. But the fact that my Subaru costs less because of the comparative advantages of trade doesn't affect my vote as much as the person that lost their job in Michigan because they believed that it fell to, to Chinese manufacturing. Right. So what you get there is this notion of salience that is in some ways more important for voting behavior than just the general aggregate statistics I gave you. Um, now this didn't start with Trump. It's a longer story in many countries, and I'm going to come back to this in a little more detail in a second. Uh, if you look at a, a American politics, the first trade bill that the labor unions opposed was 1974. Before that, the calculation was there were more benefits from exports than there was from competition from imports. And that increased over time, the opposition to trade. You've had many races before 2016 where both Republicans and Democrats in Michigan were, would run on, say, China bashing on trade issues. Uh, but Trump, you know, in many ways he was an effect, not just a cause, but he capitalized on that resentment that was there and got more votes based on trade for him than the other candidates based on general theories of free trade got, got for her. There's also the symbolic tough guy image. Um, you know, while the trade war with China has actually had more sec American sectors as losers than winners, go talk to soybean and other farmers uh, who, who paid a huge price for this, there still is this symbolic, emotional, tough guy image uh, that, that comes across, that, that, that is, is part of his support. And beyond voting salience, I think a second factor is sort of this general tough guy image uh, that comes across. I mean, the best example is Russia. Now, Republicans have been hawks on Russia, criticized Democrats like us for years about being soft on Russia. Um, but when they asked, is, is Russia a threat, is Putin a threat, 65% of Democrats are saying yes, and 35% of Republicans are saying yes. That's an incredible sleight of hand among Republicans. He's the tough guy. In fact, it's not just in the United States. My wife and I, we, we, I was doing some talks in Melbourne late last week, and we spent the weekend driving your wonderful uh, Great Ocean Road. And at one point around Apollo Bay, we were just taking a walk along the beach, and I had my Duke hat on, and, and the guy, an Aussie came, a bloke came, and he said, oh, you know, Duke, I know your basketball team. And he said, and I studied abroad at a university in South Carolina. And so we were just talking a little bit, making conversations. He said, what do you think of the president? Said, well, not much. And he says, I really like the way he called Kim Jong-un's Kim, Kim Jong-un's bluff. And I'm like, we could sit in this room and say, North Korea has built more, has enhanced their nuclear uh, weapons since then. Uh, they're getting around the sanctions. And we can make all of those, you know, you know fact-based arguments. But that impression, you know, is a lot like what happens in the United States in terms of this tough guy image. The third factor for Trump is identity politics. Issues like immigration and race and sovereignty, America first, you know, give people this sense, a lot of analysis, and it's going on in a lot of countries about, it's really about identity. And, and some of that is domestic, some of it's, you know, our own racism, not only uh, for, for, for Muslims and for Hispanics, but deep in our going back to our heritage of slavery with African Americans, anti-Semitism is on the right. And so this identity politics that's manifest of America, you know, different from the world, all are factors that, that contribute to his support on foreign policy issues, even though his overall approval rating is, is only 43.5%. Let's just throw a couple other issues out there. Uh, China. Um, uh, in a 2019 poll, when, when Americans were asked what are the critical threats in the world, only 39% said China, uh, despite the issues. Now, it might go up now because of coronavirus and everything, but this notion that I've also come back to of a new Cold War with China, the American public, uh, which you know sometimes can be very emotional, but also can be somewhat prudent and pragmatic in its views, uh, we're saying only 39%. Use of force. Um, Polling shows that actually, um, when asked about ending the uh, Afghanistan war, general public was 61% saying end it. Uh, veterans were 
You know, we are now still fighting the two longest wars in American history, uh, almost 20 years each. Close to 15,000 Americans have died. Over one million Americans have qualified for disability compensation. Uh, many bear the deep psychological and personal traumas. The total deaths inflicted on all sides of the fighting are close to 500,000, half of which were civilians. We spent over $6 trillion on these wars, uh, as well as other post-9-11 military operations. Uh, and after all this, Afghanistan ranks last on the Global Peace Index and Iraq fifth from the bottom. Uh, you know, the notion of there, there is a, um, you know, a, a more skepticism about the use of force. And some of it, if you analyze it, is, 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 is getting a sense for the gap between capabilities, still the most powerful country in the world by the usual measures of military power, and the utility of those capabilities for the kind of threats and asymmetric warfare that we face. Uh, and so there is, you know, the use of force issue, which often was used, you have to be the toughest candidate. You know, it's not the case that that's the way Americans are feeling now. One other issue to mention, we can come back to others as you like, is climate change. Um, and I've written a number of articles talking about why climate change can actually be a good general election issue. And I actually wrote these last September before your own traumatic climate change experiences. Um, so I know way back when, when I was doing some advising for then Senator Al Gore, he was mocked as Senator Ozone, right? Uh, um, and what we're seeing now, I think, is the private sector actually gets it. You're seeing the finance industry seeing that you can be green both ways both sustainable investment and making, making a profit. Um, when asked whether they would support climate change even if some jobs were lost and taxes were raised, it came out 46% yes, 39% no. And that was actually high in some key uh, states where there are big Senate races this time that might, might flip the Senate back to Democrats. Um, so those are some of the issues that are out there generally that are part of the mix. Again, there are others that may be on your mind we, we can talk about. Um, but let me turn to what I called before the deeper political dynamics that are, that are there, they were there before Trump won. Uh, they would have been there had he lost, and they're gonna be there on January 20th, 2021, irrespective of who wins the presidential election. And let me talk about three ways of thinking about these. One is what I call the, the currency ban fluctuation uh, and thinking about America's role in the world. You know, when we look at financial markets, you're always looking for currencies to fluctuate within a certain band that defines stability for financial markets, whether it's the Australian dollar, the American dollar, the euro, whatever. Um, and I can't take credit for this. It was actually the way it was put to me by a, a colleague from another country that the United States has had good relations with over the years. And, and, and that person said to me recently, um, make sure I understand your politics of the last 20 years. In 1998, you tried to impeach a president on some absolutely terrible personal behavior, but personal behavior, when policies were going really well. In 2000, you had a presidential election that was contested and had to be decided by your Supreme Court. In 2003, you went to war in Iraq in a war that many in the world opposed. In 2008, you elected an African-American named Barack Hussein Obama, and you swung way over here, in 2016, you come over here and you elect Donald Trump. Not exactly staying within the band of fluctuation. <laughs> so tell me why I should expect whatever happens in 2020, that I can be confident that you'll stay within that band of fluctuation? And I can't give a convincing answer to that. And it has to do with the depth of the dynamics of politics these days. And again, it's so important to see these ways in which Trump is effect, not just cause. Uh, uh, and so that's, that's, that, those are long-term trends that have been manifesting themselves in the country. Second thing is, is what I've also been sort of calling the toxic brew that one sees not only in the United States, but indeed in all over Europe. Um, and I mean, just as a little story, in June 2016, uh, I was invited to Chatham House in London to give a talk on foreign policy and the 2016 election. And the talk ended up being about four days after the Brexit vote, right? And so I walked into this room, and it was a room of business people, diplomats, as well as you know, scholars. And my first thing was, you know, why don't you guys tell me what's going on in the world, you know, rather than talk about what's going on in America? Uh, and it was during the headlights look, right? 
course, later that week was when, when, Britain, when England lost to Iceland in the European Cup. And if you walked into a pub, it wasn't clear which one had people more upset, right, <laughs> other than the two. But what you see happening across Europe and the United States, you can change the name, one's Brexit, one's Donald Trump, one's um, you know, the parties in Italy, one's the rise of the, of the neo-Nazi parties in Germany, uh, one is in Sweden, the so-called Sweden Democrats, which is an anti-immigrant party, which hasn't gotten power, but has gotten much more representation uh, in the Swedish parliament before. Uh, three dynamics are cutting across all these countries. One is economic dislocation. And this is actually feeding the left and the right. This is what led to the Syriza government in Greece, uh, to the rise of the Podemos pa party in Spain, uh, as well as things happening on the right. This sense of economic dislocation, which comes from globalization having a sense and having some reality of more loser, many losers along with the winners and the maldistribution of the benefits and the way in which it, it's actually been exacerbating economic inequality inside you know, uh, uh, countries in Europe and the United States. Um, when we were at Oxford, first time I met Evelyn in 2007, I remember people talking about the Polish plumber, right? Still Caucasian, taking away jobs was different, was Catholic, not Anglican, you know, was seen as not as sophisticated as Brits, taking away jobs. So this is again 2007, before we get to 2016 and Brexit. Uh, and, and, and Brexit was really, wasn't like other parts of Europe affected by the massive outflow of Syrian refugees or North African refugees, because they weren't really reaching England. They were reaching Sweden, they were reaching the continent. Um, but the sense of economic dislocation across that part of the so-called advanced industrial democratic world uh, in Western Europe and the United States, and maybe a little bit Canada, but not, you know, not, not to the same extent for, for various reasons in Canada. Um, and it's striking. It's, you know, it's feeding the left and the right in all, all those countries. But it's, it's combined with what, you know, just to be analytically neutral, I would call cultural anxiety, uh, bias, prejudice, racism, but to be neutral and try to meet people where they are, it's a sense of anxiety that people feel about the greater diversity coming into their societies. Whether it's an accurate or rose-colored view of their histories, we're losing our traditions to all these people coming here. Uh, and so it's partly this identity issue as well as the economic. And scholars can often argue which one is more important. It's really an interaction between the two. That's what a bunch of the really good analysis of our election 2016 some people argue it was really about identity and prejudice, and, and there's a notion really about economics, and, and the two interact. And so what you're seeing is this economic dislocation along with this cultural anxiety. And then a third factor, I think, is the extent to which terrorism began to be manifested within countries, in the United States, in Germany, in France, um, you know, the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, England, and other aspects, creating a sense of insecurity that demagogic leaders have been able to capitalize on. And social psychologists will tell you it's easier to capitalize on fear than hope. Uh, but it's striking how that pattern was there, uh, has been there in all those countries, which tells us something deeper than, you know, why David Cameron made a miscalculation in calling the re referendum on Brexit without trying to figure out a way that he could ensure the, uh, the outcome, or, Hillary Clinton didn't go campaign in Wisconsin and what would have happened if she did. All those are true. But these are the deeper things. Again, Brexit and Trump is a fact, not just cause. And, and, and the fact that you see it across countries with their own particular variations, you know, really gives us a sense for what these deeper political dynamics are and in some ways more concerning than, oh, if we just get rid of one leader or if they just re you know, reverse the, you know, the Brexit vote. The third one, which adds to this is particularly to the United States, um, is really taking a historical perspective. Um, so I know when you talk about you know, uh, relations or China today or, or, or other issues in Australia, you know, people often are concerned about the fear of abandonment, right? Um, because of your geographic isolation. The United States, for much of our history, from the founding of the Republic in the late 1700s, to really World War I, we could stand largely apart from the world. Uh, 
Uh, we weren't purely isolationists. We engaged. We did a lot in Latin America, uh, plenty of military interventions long before the Cold War. Uh, we had trade agreements. Jefferson fought the Barbary pirates in the, in the, in the Mediterranean in the early 1800s. But this was really, you know, times and places of our own choosing. We could largely, we had this huge continent in which we were expanding, uh, the frontier. Uh, the economy was largely, you know, based upon uh, domestic markets. Uh, and we could stand largely apart from the world. And we reverted to that again in the 1930s after World War I. You know, after World War II, and, and you know, World War II, you know, as, as many remind us, including the Brits, is we only got in the war two plus years after it started. You know, Churchill, for all his good relationships with Franklin Roosevelt, for all Franklin Roosevelt's great skills, he couldn't convince the American public to join the war until Pearl Harbor. Uh, and after the war, we came out largely, you know, as the superior country, on top of the world in many respects, um, diplomatically, ideologically, technologically, economically, militarily. Uh, and, uh, and I say that just to get an analog, it doesn't mean we used all that power well, far from it. Uh, but it was a little bit like, you know, um, about if you, if you go back to Ptolemy's theory of the universe, where he had the Earth at the center and everything revolved around it, well, we kind of felt like we were Ptolemy's Earth, right? Of course, Copernicus came along later and said that's not the way that, 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 you, that the universe functions. I think what we've been discovering in the last couple decades is we're not necessarily atop the world, we're amidst the world. We affect the world, but the world affects us. That's really different for at least what the American political culture is. We were used to kind of calling the shots and telling people what to do. And again, it wasn't purely like that. Even with our allies, we had fights with the Europeans in the 1960s over trade and NATO and issues with our uh, uh, Asian allies over Vietnam and a variety of things. But it's this sense of disorientation of, you know, we're affected by terrorism coming into the country. We're affected by immigration coming into the country. We always have been, but the, you know, I think the fact that it that has been people of color adds more to it. And I think that that goes along with the other aspects, the, um, the, the toxic brew, to give you a sense for what the culture is. And I'm not sort of saying this, saying you've got to understand and let Americans be Americans, but to really, again, get past the news and the CNN news cycles about what's happening with Donald Trump or, or with different candidates. Uh, the the, the COVID-19 crisis is really interesting in that effect, right? Uh, and some of the reaction to it from this administration has been somebody else's problem, it's not really, or whatever, it's a hoax, it's really out to make me look bad or whatever. Um, this is an amazing example for the world of globalization, you know, uh, in ways that the world is interconnected no matter what one does, right? This wasn't a biological weapon that somebody spread to, you know, bring smallpox back with an, with an intentionality. This, this sort of happened. And so the interconnectedness is a, is a really good, interesting example of amidst the world. Now, it can lead people to be more frightened of the world, uh, but it also may lead to a sense of the only way you can manage these sorts of things, because they're going to happen again and again, uh, is through finding ways to work together with different parts of the world. Um, so that's the deeper dynamics beyond what the polling data is that are going on, this sort of toxic brew that we share with much of the uh, 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 of the Western world, uh, but this American transition to being engaged in the world more than we were in our earlier history when we can't feel like we, we can really call the shots. So where does that leave us for the debate about American foreign policy as we enter this three, third decade in the American century? I'm going to sort of give you three or four, we like to call it grand strategy, makes us feel you know, like we're doing really big things, right? Uh, but it's the sort of the framing, you know, what academics call paradigms, what communication specialists call frames, that sort of a lot fits in. And again, in general terms, and then we can, um, we can, we can dig in. So the first frame is the America First frame, right? Um, when Trump first used the term back in May or June 2016, many of the literati saying, I can't believe he's doing this, this was the expression that those in the 1930s used in the United States who were somewhat sympathetic to the Nazis. We were America first. He used it anyway, and he defined it with his MAGA hats and everything. And it relates to the things I said before. You know, the argument that America's been abused by the world, 
right? We've been taken advantage of. I suspect a lot of people in this room may say, wait a second, <laughs> you know, it's not the way we see it, right? Um, you know, we've given more than we've gotten. Uh, trade deals have been unfair. Why are we defending the world with American troops? Why are we spending money? Why aren't NATO allies living up to their commitment to 2.7% of GDP for, for defense budgets? Um, it's a panel next week I'll be a part of as well. But, you know, on can we trust America? That's related to a new issue of your, one of your journals. Um, and this has had appeal for the reason I said before, identity, uh, tough guy out there, uh, you know, the facts don't really matter. Uh, I actually think that um, partly through trade, where you've seen groups saying, wait a second, you know, we're, we're, we're losing, you know, in many respects in this trade war, whether it's been with China or Europe or Japan or Brazil, uh, whether it's through global supply chains or retaliation against American exporters who have big markets overseas like agriculture. And this is where it's be very interesting to see how this COVID-19 plays in, right? In a very common sense way, for people that aren't that concerned with the kind of foreign policy issues that a lot of us in this room are concerned with, um, do people start to say, look, all I know, I mean, think about the effect this has had on daily life. You know, after 9-11, we were profoundly affected. It was the most direct attack on our country since the British had burned uh, the White House in the War of 1812. And Pearl Harbor, although that was still, why it wasn't a state, it was still offshore. So I'm really speaking of the mainland United States. Um, the, the lowest point the stock market reached was 14.2%. It bounced up today, but it already hit 19.5%. But the basic calculation, my university announced today that we're not going to finish the spring semester. They closed the dorms. We're going totally online. You know, I know there's been a lot of this in Australia with the number of Chinese students and others. I've been at Monash, I've been at Sydney, I've been here. Uh, uh, big events are being canceled. Uh, this big event that is, it happens in Austin, Texas called South by Southwest, which is a huge techie community event. Concerts, culture, a lot of money at stake, totally canceled. Um, you know, schools being closed. New Rochelle, which is a suburb of New York City, being totally sort of like has happened in parts of China, walled off with the National Guard there. You know, we haven't had an international event affect our daily life. The average person, there's not a person, it's hardly a person who wakes up in the world today that doesn't think about how this is affecting what they're gonna do that day or the following week, or can they, can I get a flight home <laughs> in 10 days, you know, um, you know and the like. So the, the effect of that on the America first mentality can be exploited, but I also think in some respects it says, look, you know, no matter what we do, we're interconnected with the world. And yeah, maybe here and there we push for a better deal. We've got to figure out how to work together. You know, if you look at the, some of the other crises, Ebola and others, which were contained and they didn't in our countries as much, it was the, um, you know, our Center for Disease Control and Prevention working with others groups like the Gates Foundation, Doctors Without Borders, the World Health Organization. So I, I'm waiting to see, and it's something to follow, the effect that this has, even if it kind of goes away next week, which it's not gonna do, on the basic notion of we can just call our own shots. And again, in a very common sense way, the you know, suburban family that just doesn't really think about foreign policy, but this being affected by the world, it'll be very interesting to see. And I, I'm willing to say that I think it, is going to make it much harder, plus the way the administration has handled it. Building a new tennis court on the grounds of the White House. See, I told you I couldn't call all this thing back, you know. <laughs> Playing golf, saying it's a hoax, not taking it seriously. Um, it just doesn't make sense to most people. There's an element that will, that will discount that, but it's, it's not a, a huge percentage. But that will remain one of the frames in which this presidential election will be fought out. Um, which is not a traditional Republican frame. The old neoconservative or others were, were much more about America kind of doing a lot around the world. The second frame is, can we go back to that liberal international order? What I sort of call the restorationist frame. One might associate this with Vice President Biden, you know, and what his candidacy represents. You know, what about that liberal international order from 1945 to the early 1990s that had America like Ptolemy's Earth at the center? Uh, that, you know, moved trade along, that, you know, uh, did a variety of things. Um, here, too, I, I think that 
first of all, there's a lot of debate about how good the liberal national order was, right? Uh, you know, it, I mean, some of, you know, the Vietnam War was part of it. Uh, America's willingness to support um, dictators around the world, as long as they weren't communists, whether it was in Latin America or the Middle East or Africa or, or here in Asia. I mean, those were all part of that liberal order. So it was a mixed bag, even if one argues that it had a lot of successes. But the biggest thing is it was historically unique. It was, you know, based upon the distribution of power coming out of 1945, where Europe was devastated, Japan was devastated, much of the rest of the world were colonies, and the United States was more or less left standing. We, we had, you know, juiced up our economy for, for fighting the war and others. And so that was a particular distri distribution of power. As that has changed, why would we think that a particular order, even if we think it was really good, would necessarily work under different circumstances. It's a little bit like uh, Francis Fukuyama's theory of the end of history, the notion that history would end and capitalism, democracy, you know, would reach an end point. And here, too, we saw the pillars of the liberal order crumbling even before Trump drove a bulldozer for him. Um, the challenges to, to the Western global economic order, not only within countries, but really since the 1970s, the global south had been challenging it. Many international institutions were underperforming, and those of us who believe in international institutions need to take a hard look about which ones were effective, which ones weren't, and why, but they were underperforming. Uh, American power as the guarantor of the system was being more and more contested, particularly uh, after the Iraq war. So it had a very mixed record, and even the global financial crisis of 2008, the notion that the American economy was driving the international economy, well, in this case, we were the ones that drove it into a wall, and the reaction to that was, was you, know, um, um, what, you know, raised a lot of questions. So this notion of restoration, and it's one thing to say, let's kind of get back to working with our NATO allies, with our partners around the world, let's stop insulting them, uh, let's rethink you know, climate change, let's rethink uh, the nuclear non-proliferation agreement with Iran. You know, those are sort of trying to be, you know, you know, level the boat, equilibrate the boat. But the notion that this provides a path going forward for us in the world um, doesn't mean everything about it is over. But as the core structure, I think, is, uh, is frankly some wishful thinking. The third kind of frame that's been getting some legs lately um, uh, is this notion of a new Cold War with China. Um, it's actually becoming a fairly prevalent view in the United States, and it's somewhat bipartisan. Um, some of my Democratic friends, you know, it's always better to be seen as tough rather than soft politically. Um, a lot of debate here, you know, about how to deal with China, you know, uh, as a country in this region. Um, I was on a panel the other night in Sydney, and some of my um, some of my other panelists were talking about, oh yeah, well the Americans had this illusion that if we brought China into the system, it would become a nice little democracy. And I'm like, we never really thought that. We thought we could work with them, but that's sort of one of these ideas that's gotten sort of what we call an urban myth, you know, that's being used a lot and. Um, um, there are some people that believe that, but it wasn't the dominant view of why you tried to work out relations with China. The dominant view went back to the deal that Henry Kissinger and John Lai struck in 1972. Um, so in my Peacemakers book that I wrote about leaders from around the world that made major breakthroughs, I've got Nelson Mandela in the book, I've got Gorbachev, I've got some others we haven't heard of, like the British lawyer who founded Amnesty International in 1961 and launched the modern human rights movement. And I have a chapter on Kissinger and John Lai. Uh, I have to interview Kissinger. It didn't, wasn't, it's not an endorsement of the rest of Kissinger's foreign policy, but the basic deal they struck has done pretty well for almost a half a century. You know, it's managed the relationship. Again, it doesn't mean it necessarily carries forward in the same form, um, but this notion of a new Cold War with China, I think the, in many ways China has become more assertive and somewhat aggressive with in, you know, issues here in Australia in terms of intervention in the political system, the South China Sea issues and, and the like. But again, we can come back to this, but I have three concerns about this becoming uh, the dominant paradigm in the United States. Um, one is lessons of the past. We have made more mistakes, I argue, in our foreign policy by overestimating and misestimating threats than by underestimating them. Again, I'll come back to Vietnam and others. And so the notion of doing, you know, understanding that there are some aspects of China that are threat, but this new Cold War, I think, leads to the trap of, of overestimation. Um, secondly are the realities of the present. Um, as you look around the world, it's not a world that's lining up in blocks. There are very few countries in the world that want to sign up with just one team. I don't think Australia does. 
Uh, I think most countries in this region does. I know I've done a lot of work in the Middle East, and you look at countries in the Middle East, you look at Israel, for which Trump has been uh, rather supportive, shall we say, uh, is maintaining close relations with Russia. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has gone to Moscow more than he's come to Washington. There's a hotline between the Israeli Air Force and the Russian air base in Syria for deep conflicting, which has failed a couple times, uh, and with China. Israel, the Israelis gave China a contract to manage the port of Haifa that the Americans were very upset about because it's near one of the naval bases. The Israelis did it anyway. Uh, the Saudis are having a little spat with the Russians now, but they've been working closely with the Russians. They're working closely with the Chinese as well as us. And again, Trump's been you know, rather supportive of uh, the Egyptians and the like. Uh, uh, and, and so I think that the notion of a world that there's a new Cold War and you're either with us or China, this isn't the way countries see their interests. Right? And moreover, if you try to do that, Countries can say, oh, you know, I can reverse leverage you because you want me to sign up with your team. And so from an American point of view, I think it's actually counterproductive. Um, so the realities of the present work against it. Um, and third is the net assessment of the relationship. Not only going back to Kissinger and Joe and Lai, but despite our differences, we worked together during the Obama years on the Iran uh, nuclear non-proliferation agreement. We worked with the Russians and the Chinese. We worked with the Russians to spice Syria and Ukraine work with the Chinese. Why? Because we had a shared interest uh, on that issue uh, in preventing Iranian nuclear population and trying to get a new relationship with Iran uh, that could lead to other improvements in the relation. We worked together approaching the Paris Climate Accord, where the US and China kind of came together to a certain extent to make it different than the 2009 Copenhagen Conference, which blew up. So if you look at the relationship, you see you know, some areas where there can be confrontation. <laughs> Some areas where there can be lots of competition. We are competing technologically in other ways, and some areas where we cooperate. Uh, and I think that's a much better frame for, um, for that. <coughs> the other point, I think, is bandwidth. And this leads into my, my where I think we, we should go. Uh, and then I'm going to stop and, and open it up. If policymakers are totally fixated on new Cold War with China, there's not a lot of bandwidth, uh, not just resources, but getting high-level policymakers' attention for some of the big threats we face, like climate change, like global pandemic prevention. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that's another factor saying, you know, the, the threats and the interests are much broader than this. It's probably the most important bilateral relationship in the world today, dyad, as they say. The U.S. China is going to have more effect on other countries. But it's not so important that it's the frame within which you define the entire world. So where do we need to go instead? Um, and I wrote an article in the fall uh, called Right Sizing. And you can Google it um, on my name and, and the article. And the idea is to make our commitments and initiatives fit our priorities uh, and, and, and try and, you know, not to do everything in the world, but make some priorities uh, and think through the strategies for them. And just a couple elements of that. First of all, much more restraint about war and military force. Not only the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, we have special operations forces deployed in about 150 countries. Terrorism is a continuing threat, but 150 countries' deployments, uh, first of all, what have been the returns? What has been the net assessment? What have we gained and what have we contributed to the problem? And, and how sustainable is that? Um, uh, and whether it's worth the interest and whether diplomacy is a better strategy. You know, if I were to ask, or I ask my students, what are the major successes the United States has had in the contemporary world? Well, the list will have um, the 1978 Camp David Agreement between Israel and Egypt, failed on the Palestinian camp, but has had a peace between Israel and Egypt for over 40 years. Uh, many of the arms control agreements with the Soviet Union. Um, the 1995 Dayton Accord that didn't solve all the problems of the Balkans, but stopped the worst of the killing, all diplomatic. Uh, uh, the 2015 Iran nuclear non-proliferation agreement. So think about ways in which we can achieve our, our interests and, and help others in the world more diplomatically. Secondly, alliances and partnerships need to be based on interests as they are now, not, they may, not how they may have been in the Cold War. It doesn't mean you just pick up and abandon countries you had relationships with, but you do some reassessing about what your interests are and what the scope of those relationships are. Top of my list, uh, frankly, is Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, uh, 
we're not as dependent on that oil anymore. We're dependent on its effects in global financial markets. Right now, they're having an effect on oil prices that are not favorable. Um, you go down the list, the Yemen war, you know, the brutal butchering of a dissident, you know, uh, Khashoggi, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, um, and you know, the exporting that they did of their own, for their own internal stability of Salafism, which contributed to radicalization in, in Western Africa and a variety of places. But just one example, that you really need to, you know, have your alliances and partnerships based on interests as they are now. And then you need to work with your allies more uh, uh, for more collaboration and comparative advantage. So I, I, there's a lot of discussions I've been having here in Australia with people that we each, you know, we have some concerns about China's role, as you do in the region. Um, but, you know, what is the best balance to be achieved? It's not by turning it into a zero-sum Cold War between the United States and China. There are things that America can do in its relationship with China, its relationship with an ally. But what are, you know, what are the things that, that are opportunities for Australian foreign policy and Japanese foreign policy and South Korean foreign policy and Indian foreign policy? You know, I think there's going to be much more of a, of a collaboration in this region, it's true in Europe as well, than just, you know, sort of the pros and cons of America playing, playing the dominant role. Um, uh, we also need to ensure that trade and other economic globalization benefits are more widely shared. It goes back to the points I made earlier. I mean, I think the sense of, uh, of the way the globalization, you know, the financialization of globalization has exacerbated economic inequality in our country and in other countries. And if we want the global economy to keep functioning, there's going to have to be a better sense that the benefits um, are, are more widely shared. The last two points are much more priority for this century's. So we, we would refer to weapons, to nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons as WMD, right, weapons of mass destruction. But I think what we now face are two other MDs, EMD, environmental mass destruction, uh, and I was struck, I guess in January, by an article in the New York Times written by Richard Flanagan, the Australian novelist, who juxtaposed the 1958 um, novel and movie on the beach, which was about nuclear catastrophe and was set here in Australia, <coughs> the only survivors. I remember seeing this as a kid. And it actually was one of the contributors in changing the, the, the um, dialogue to the first agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1963 for the limited test ban treaty. The exposition of that in his article and the Bush fires, uh, and the notion that, you know, we need any more evidence that climate change is not a future thing is present. Uh, and, and, and it was an interesting argument. And I think that, um, you know, I think it's fair to talk about environmental mass destruction. And I think it's also fair to talk about DMD, diseases of mass destruction. Uh, and so if we think about this in terms of threats, these are not low politics issues to deal with when we're get, you know, done with all the things that the, you know, grown-ups do, like arms control. There are very real issues in, in so many ways. And I think the United States is positioned to play an important role here as a leader in terms of the technologies we have, the expertise we have. Uh, again, I'm seeing this in our private sector, more willingness to put money behind sustainability, uh, as is happening in other countries. And it would be a real opportunity to show leadership uh, in ways consistent with that. And then the last point I'll make um, is to help the American people deal with this notion of being amidst the world. You know, we can talk till we're blue in the face and oh, you should understand this and the facts and why don't you know where certain countries are in the map and da 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 da. Doesn't get you very far. And it's also not the way to think about it. As I said, I said it before, people, are, people have anxiety and they're confused. And some people are flat out prejudiced. But many people are confused and have anxiety. And so I think if you're a leader in our country, a president or other kinds of opinion leaders, help the American people understand what it means to be interconnected in a world. And to be in a world in which the United States probably still will remain the single most powerful country, but is not the country that's Ptolemy's Earth, at the center of things and can call the shots. Uh, uh, and I think to help people understand that is really what leadership's about. Um, that's what Nelson Mandela did in South Africa. You know, the Afrikaner community was deathly afraid of this guy when he came out. Uh, and he helped them understand what the transition to, you know, majority democracy would be. It didn't solve all South Africa's problems, but we could go back and say, if you'd gone, you know, to Ladbrokes in London or Las Vegas in the United States and said, I want to bet that South Africa will make a peaceful transition to democracy, we all could have been wealthy, right? 
Uh, that's what Gorbachev did in the Soviet Union. He ultimately lost, you know, lost control of that. And I think that's what really leadership is about. It's really about in my country. I think it's about it in your country as well. To help people understand, you know, what the nature of the world, how they can be safe and successful in it, but that that really is very different than the world that they knew or they think they knew in different areas. So, hope that gives us some food for thought. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome your comments and, and questions. Thanks. <laughs>
there was a petition called We're Still In. You can go online and see it. And it was signed by a number of cities and states. You know, like California has a big deal, a number of cities, and a number of companies that said, we will still try, you know, unless you make it too uneconomical for us to meet the goals. So they can't substitute for government policy and for international agreements, but they can play, like you're saying, a really crucial role. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, as an international relations student here, these are all issues that we're talking about. They're at the, the forefront of what we're discussing at the moment. Um, but do you think that in this time where leaders need to lead, they are actually, you know, American government, bureaucrats, policymakers, politicians coming to terms with these facts? Are they coming to terms with America's changing place in the world, or do they remain in, in denial or with a, a hubris that can sometimes be embedded in American culture to say, no, we're still the best, we're still on top? Is, is this change actually something that we're starting to, to really feel embedded within the system of government itself? Thank you. It's a great question. I, I think on, you know, on, on, on the first part, you know, look, I have no confidence you know, there have been many administrations with which I've disagreed with, but I respect it. And there are many people, Republicans and others, that are colleagues in the university world and in the Washington world that I disagree with, but I respect their professionalism. And I think the general sense of this administration is not that. It really isn't. I mean, it's very hard, you know, to, to say when they, you know, when science isn't considered relevant for, you know, pandemic prevention or environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the latter part of it was what I was trying to get at, why notwithstanding those kinds of the current administration, I really want us to understand that these issues would have been there on January 1st, 20th, 2017, and they'll be there 2021, irrespective of who's in office. And that's where I think the debate is difficult. And I'm trying to be, I, I try to be empathetic with it, not, you know, if you knew what I knew kind of thing. That doesn't really help us very much. We're trying to engage people. Um, and so there I think it's, it's this confusion, it's this anxiety, um, that there are enough people, I think, that are reachable, which is sort of my speculation about the COVID-19 effect, that, you know, globalization is, it has its bad parts, it has its good parts, but you're not going to make it go away. And then I looked at some of the things I wrote about in the Peacemakers book. Again, who would have thought that South Africa could have made a peaceful transition, right? But leadership mattered. And, you know, who would have thought the Cold War would end peacefully? And I will give some credit to Ronald Reagan there. He partnered in his second term in ways that some of his hawks were quite upset about. He partnered with Gorbachev. But Gorbachev was the principal actor. Uh, and, and many other examples. You know, I, I read about Yitzhak Rabin and what he tried to do in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And he ultimately paid the price of being assassinated. So if you look at these other times where things seem you know, somewhat hopeless or we're going to throw up our hands and we saw a change there's no reason why we can't see those kind of things today. Uh, and again, I'd love to see it come from others. You know, in many other areas, the, the most notable Secretary General of the UN in the 1950s was Dag Hammarskjöld. And people used to refer to him as the secular pope because he had this legitimacy as the leader. And he played a huge role. The 1956 Suez Crisis, which almost exploded into a, another world war, he managed the diplomacy. So it can come from many people in the world. I'm open to those. I'd like to see us do our share. But it can't and doesn't have to just come from American leaders. Uh, thanks very much, Professor Gentleson, for a really big tour de force uh, of American politics. David, Good. Uh, David Goyne's my name, by the way. Uh, but if you can see that we're facing an inflection point in November, if we get four more years of Trump, I mean, you're looking at the gradual destruction of the US global alliance system, you know, as it falls apart. So I can see where that path would head. If we got an alternative administration, a, most likely now perhaps a Biden administration, what would that look like? I accept it's not going back to what it was, but what would that look like? Yeah, I think, you know, in social <laughs> science terms, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. I mean, four more years, again, you know. Um, 
what I see happening in our country beyond policy A, B, or C is the undermining of core norms and institutions mm -hmm. of society, right? Some people say if the next president lied 20% of the time, we'd think it was an improvement. And that's really problematic. I mean, it really is for any society. Those are hard to put back in the box. Political violence, um, you know, the, all the hatreds. And I'm Muslim, and I'm Hispanic, and I'm black, you know, and I'm Semitism, et cetera. Um, so there's no question about that. And I think what one of the things that Vice President Biden has represented, and I've worked with him, and, a lot of respect for him, we have a longer discussion about some concerns I have about the candidacy. What he's represented is, is an opportunity to equilibrate, right? Um, and I think his pitch will be, I'll bring in a team, uh, and, 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 and I think also it will be saying to people, don't, whatever your vision of the perfect is, don't let it be the enemy of the good. So, you know, in 2000, when I was one of, Vice President Gore's senior foreign policy advisors. And there are all these people that said, there's no difference between Al Gore and George Bush, I'm gonna vote for Ralph Nader. You know, we lost Florida that way, we lost, we lost the election. And um, it's a longer conversation over a lot of beer. You know, um, and in 2016, there were, there were 4.4 million Obama voters in 2012 who did not vote in 2016. And then some moved from Obama to Trump, that's fine, that was their decision. Some of them voted for the couple third party candidates. So if you look at the data from a couple of the key states, it was in the third party. And so the notion of, um, you know, of, of coming together on that, that's where a lot of what's happening now is going. And I think there's also a whole lot of um, efforts to try to win the Senate. The Senate, that basically the count, you need three seats if you win the presidency, there are two Democratic seats that are vulnerable. There are about five or six Republican that are vulnerable. So a lot of the thrust has come for people to want to do that. Um, and um, if you want the real expert on this, our son, Adam, is in the middle of this and is a columnist for G uh, GQ and has a column that just came out the other day about why it's important to do all these things. And you can Google him and, and see, you know, he's really in the middle of the politics. So that's my sense. You know, got to equilibrate. I think the challenge for a Biden administration would be you know, not just doing the things that we think Trump did wrong, but how do we start to deal with this future and being open to that and surrounding yourself with enough people who are not just wedded to the old ways? So that's the necessary but not sufficient part that, that, I, that I would argue. Dr. Beck. Hello, my question relates to Trump's foreign policy. Um, despite Trump being America first and not really interested in foreign policy, he seems to have done a bit on foreign policy. You look at North Korea or the trade war with China, and at one stage he wanted to buy Greenland. Um, your presentation had a lot of um, three key points in it, and I'd be very interested to know, what do you think Trump's three priorities are, three key priorities are um, for foreign policy, and how do you think they're different to the State Department's three key policies? Sure. So, I mean, I, I think I would say one is um, close relations with Putin. You know, also speculation why and everything. I mean, I think we've seen that with that extraordinary Helsinki press conference, you know, uh, and the whole Russia things. And I think for whatever reasons, you know, and the, and the Europeans have been trying to work. You know, I think the Russians are beginning to find out that, you know, that the Ukraine war is costing them in a lot of different ways. And there may be some openness to what was called the Minsk, you know, process of an effort to find some common ground. Uh, so that's one, I think, is this very crazy that, and that flipped, as I said before, somehow Republicans don't think Putin's a threat, which is pretty mind-boggling. Um, second, I think, as everything comes down to economics, he really, he, he, you know, he actually has a theory of the economy, and it's very much about, you know, this transactionalism. So his trade wars have been the notion that, you know, somehow I can get what I want out of that. Uh, the so-called peace deal for the Middle East was financial incentives for the Palestinians, but you don't get any state. So he actually has, you know, to give, to, you know, to give him a theory, he actually believes economics drives everything and, and deal making. And um, we all know economics is important. I think the problem with that is the way he does it actually doesn't work, right? 
Um, and the third, I think, somehow, is this solidarity and admiration with, with authoritarian leaders. You know, um, it's part of the concerns about the second administration, whether it's, you know, when others in the administration have tried to say new Cold War with China, he actually says, I like Xi Jinping, right? Or, or the Saudi crown prince, or Erdogan in Turkey, or Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, but I guess in all of that, it's really about the, the showmanship. So he did the summits with, with, with Kim Jong-un because he thought it was like a, a good TV moment and that he'd get credit. And as Mar Wasi colleagues we met the other day sort of reflected, and again, I'm sure you know other people that said that. I know other people that said that in my country. He somehow gets credit for sort of doing that. And, 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 and so th that's what I would say. I mean, he, he believes in strongman rule. Uh, he's run a, a, a family company this whole time. He hasn't had a board of directors to appoint to, to, to um, you know, be responsible to. Uh, he has this thing with Russia, and, um, uh, and he believes that economics drives everything. Uh, thank you. Um, Bruce, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I wondered if I might get your help to answer a question that I was asked. Um, there are a lot of students here today, which is really nice to see. Um, and I was asked this by an undergraduate recently, and I found myself a bit stuck for an answer. Um, you know, viewed from their point of view, you know, this is an accelerated age in so many ways. Um, and I was asked, you know, Professor Go, you know, your analysis is great and everything, but there's a bit of a sense, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you know, when we do these analyses, we assume that we have what the French call a long durée to, to think about this, right? A long time sort of period. Um, and in regard to, to what you've just said very sensibly about the prospects for America, the things that would change and wouldn't change, what's the, what do you regard as the sort of time frame of opportunity for the US, right? Um, Mandela was in prison for decades before he was able to make a change in South Africa. The day to, the, today's world is very different. This generation, young generation, is the one that doesn't, is, isn't even sure that they've got 30 years ahead of them, right? Um, what's the time frame for America to have an opportunity to actually continue to lead anything? Um, you know, again, in the past five years even, the thing that's been most marked in this part of the world, and also in Europe, is, you know, is the sort of quite consistent fleeing into self-help that you see on the part of U.S. allies, right? So it's not just about loss of confidence in the United States. It's also the sense that we haven't got time right. to wait for you guys to sort yourselves out because these problems are pressing on our doorstep, right? right? And, but this is very much in accord with how, you know, our younger generations today view you know, their lives in the world ahead. So what's the time frame we're talking about? Yeah, no, it's funny. I hear the same from my students. And so some of the polling data um, within the trends I talked about shows the so-called millennial generation as even feeling more strongly that this notion of, you know, why is America trying to do everything around the world, right? Um, and I cite some of this in that right-sizing article, and it's very interesting. And also that the pitch, the standard liberal internationalist pitch is engagement and leadership, right? Well, what does that mean? Engage who, when, how, what? And, and again, we'll hear a lot, this is sort of the, will come out, out of a lot of Vice President Biden's campaign, or America has to be the, and, and, and that rhetoric, a lot of both um, folks groups and polling shows doesn't play with the other generation, right? And I think that's good, and so some people, one of the New York Times columnists, David Brooks, wrote a column saying, oh, they're lost. And I said, no, actually, there's a lot of smartness out there, right? And so the notion of American leadership to me is not that I actually, to me, one of the, you know, making lemonade out of lemons of the Trump years could be countries around the world, and going back to my 20 years of American politics, say, yeah, we really need to figure out what our priorities are, what a role we're going to play in the world, not anti or pro-American, but what we can accomplish on issues like climate change or disease prevention or you know, balance in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. I think that should continue. I think whatever happens in the, next, in the next administration, it should not be, hey, the Americans are back, we're here to 
kind of you know, run things. So I actually think that that's where the world needs to go. Even in the spirit of creativity, right? Not all best ideas are made in Washington and never have been. Uh, and so I, and, and, and actually if you think about this sort of comparative advantage idea coming out of trade, what are the comparative advantages? I mean the Canadians and the Norwegians have played this a lot over the years, right? Who led the world towards the landmine treaties in the 1990s? It was NGOs and the Canadians and the Norwegians. You know, what role have the Canadians played? They were very involved with your former foreign minister, Gareth Evans, and the whole responsibility to protect, and their foreign minister at the time, Lloyd Axel. So I'd love to see more of that happen, and I think the United States should welcome that. At the same time, I think, because of our size, we will always be, you know, an important role to play. Uh, but it's not instead of, it should be in addition to. Time frame, you know, it's a lot worse than it was four years ago. I mean, so if we're saying, well, let's get, you know, you know, amity among allies, that's not going backwards and all these things have happened. Um, but I try to think in terms of not just, you know, you know, I mean, Brendan knows, you know, things come across your desk and it's like what's in the morning cables or everything, what happened in the world. But I always feel that, that um, governments need, you know, corporations have a vice president for sales whose job depends upon the core of the return and a vice president for strategic planning, who's not some futurist economist in a think tank, but is what do I do today to position Siemens or Sony or you know, uh, Apple or whomever in the world with the way markets are changing, where they're gonna be. We need that in government too. I think the, our military actually does that a little better than, you know, I've been on the policy planning staff at the State Department and that's where, when it was created after World War II and the first director was George Kennan, uh, appointed by Dean Acheson, and you know, we teach our students how to write memos. And Secretary Acheson's memo to George Kennan about policy planning staff was two words, avoid trivia. And it was supposed to be this kind of strategic, so I think we have to be doing both, right? Uh, and, and I think, you know, we've had this clock, that, the doomsday clock, that was about nuclear weapons, you know, was it 1150, 750? I think we need to think about some of these other issues, you know, as well that way. We had a question here. Thanks for such a deep account. Um, it's a bit um, mind um, uh, overwhelming in some ways. But um, in the, here, we really do care what's going on in America. Um, and in fact, Planet America, a show that uh, many of us are devoted to, is on the ABC tonight. Um, and uh, we really do feel that in the up, um, upcoming election, you know, who wins does matter to Australia and our own prospects and sense of security. But here we have compulsory voting. And I just wonder whether you have any comments about the fact that in America it's an entirely different scenario. It's all about getting the vote out. And um, also, um, if Biden is successful for his side, um, he seems to be a very old man, and um, the um, choice of his vice president candidate, you know, do you have any views about that? So I, I, I think I would say, I've been wrong about a lot of things, but I, I think it's highly likely that he'll, uh, he'll choose a woman, um, and a younger woman, for the reasons that you're talking about and for just the way this worked out. We had a whole diverse range of candidates, and we ended up with two white guys in their late 70s in the party, and then a third in the White House. Um, and I think what he'll also do, my guess, is as the campaign goes on, it, what we're going to do, we're going to see a lull. Because the de Democrats are basically over now, um, for the most part. And then there'll be the conventions. And then it really starts uh, what we call our Labor Day, which is the beginning of the fall, September. That's when it really starts. At some point, whatever the strategic point is from his strategist, he will probably, when George W. Bush was running against Al Gore and people were worried about his foreign policy expertise, at a certain point in the campaign he said, I want to know who, I want you to know who are the people that are going to surround me. Talked about Colin Powell and others. I think Biden will do that as well with certain positions, you know, not the whole cabinet, but some that will give people a reassurance of youth and vigor and hopefully some innovative thinking. I think you'll see those things. So he's running as a team. Somebody asked me today, you know, you know, who's going to win? I, yeah, he said, look, think about this like a war. In the sense, whoever has the best strategy is going to win. I, we can make an argument why Trump's going to get reelected. You can make an argument why Biden's going to win. You can make an argument why Biden's going to win a landslide or a squeaker, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't really know that. Uh, but I think it's very important. And I, you know, I tried 
to give you a sense, again, in this notion of the things that are going on beyond just the things you can see on TV, you know, that, that, that are stuff I think people are more familiar with. But that's, that's a very important dynamic that I think he will, he will do. On the voting, you know, two things. One is, you're right, you know, we, do, we vote on a work day, Tuesdays. And, um, you know, best case scenario, in a presidential election, you get maybe around 60% of registered voters that vote. And there's a process for registering, so that's not the full eligible electorate over 18 years old. Uh, in the midterm elections we do Congress, like in 2018, is in the 30s. Um, what's even worse now is there's been a, a lot of efforts, what's called voter suppression. This happened in 2016, it's happening at the state levels where people are being intimidated uh, and is usually targeted certain groups, African Americans, you know, lower economic sector people. And that's been going on a lot. And uh, there have been efforts to counter that. But in addition to the normal, and turnout rates tend to be lower among people at lower incomes, 18 to 25 year olds vote at lower rates. You'd think for some of the reasons that were said before, they voted higher rates, they've typically voted at lower rates. Uh, so all those are factors. And, and there have been move movements to get compulsory voting, to move it to a Sunday. But the parties that think they would lose by that oppose it. And that's where we are. So you know, maybe we'll get up to 60 percent in the presidential election, maybe 62, but that's not very high compared to most democracies. Question up the back. Hi, Anzia. Thanks for the talk. Um, just noting that uh, you said that a lot of the conditions that got Trump elected in 2016 still exist today. What would be your advice to, uh, let's go with Joe Biden, um, in terms of strategy to win the next election? So on the domestic economy, um, the number of jobs created in the last three years of the Obama administration are more than the jobs created in the first three years of the Trump administration just factually, so jobs. Secondly, to the extent that jobs have been created, so I'll talk economics here, jobs have been created, it hasn't done anything about the rising economic inequality. And thirdly, he's blown the debt out of the water. You know, the 2017 tax cut um, didn't even stimulate, you know, it largely went to, to financial investments. Companies stocked up on their cash reserves. So I'd make the case that, you know, and then of course now the notion of him pointing to Wall Street even if it goes back up, people, folks have seen it can go down, right? So I think there's an economic case to be made there uh, that's important. On foreign policy, you know, I think it's this question of has it made us safer or not? And I think you can argue that it hasn't. It's made us beat our chests and, and a certain amount of bluster. You know, there's probably, I don't have a, I'm not, you know, that much of an answer, probably 30, 32, 34% of the electorate they'll be with Trump no matter what. But that's not 40-something. Maybe I'm too low on that. But, um, but I think it hasn't made us safer. And then the whole you know, COVID-19 thing, to compare the way that pandemics were handled in the Obama years, uh, and, and to make the case that you know, trying to you know, not have good relations with the rest of the world isn't charity on our part, you know, and it's not altruism to have them. It's, it's, it's self-interest. So that, you know, and, and you could get, you know, with certain constituencies, you get into certain issues specifically, right? You know, uh, I'd play the Putin card a lot, you know, and um, so that, that's how I, I, those are some of the things I would hit. And also the civility card. I mean, Biden's greatest strength is that people like him. He's a likable guy. Um, and there's some issues coming out lately, he's kind of getting thin-skinned out there on the campaign trail, and they, they, they folks got to work with him to manage that. Um, but he's been a likable person his whole career. You know, there are other pros and cons to him. So, you know, likable, um, you know, and he's not identified, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, there was some sexism involved, was, some, was seen as the, the epitome of the elite. And that was part of that fall off in the vote. Um, very capable person, but that was right. Biden does not seem like that. He's a you know he he's a working you know kind of working class guy. Uh, he grew up in a town in Northeast Pennsylvania called Scranton, Pennsylvania, where my mother grew up. 
you know, it's a working class place that has, you know, Polish community, Italian community, African American community, Jewish community. So I think the, the, those are, that's the personal and the others are some of the policy. Hello, there's a lot of commentary on that the President Trump is causing the, uh, accelerating the decline of America's sin in the world. How are other strongman leaders accelerating that too? Like you have in Britain, Boris Johnson saying that a trade deal will only be in British, Britain's interest. Like America can't touch the NHS. In Turkey, rest, uh, Erdogan saying that we're not getting Patriot missiles, we want Russian missiles. You have Russia trying to reclaim its dominance in the world. China been trying to be dominant in every field. In Japan, Abe Shinzo wanting to change the constitution and become independent of America. Narendra Modi wanting to protect India's trade relations. So how do those other strongman leaders accelerate when they were rejecting? Emmanuel Macron saying that we need to look and reevaluate NATO. So has Trump been accelerating or is other leaders also playing a role? Good question. So some of that is this identity politics that I talked about in the U.S. that's happening. Modi clearly is playing on that, you know, in very problematic ways. Uh, Putin has been, you know, sort of saying, you know, this is, you know, Russian history. Xi Jinping talks about the century of humiliation. People are playing on, on, on this version of nationalism all around the world. Erdogan, the Ottoman tradition, uh, and, and doing it in ways that, again, appeals to people's sort of, you know, internal sense of me against you and fear over hope. Um, but that's not the way people had seen America. Again, I, you know, it's not that we were all good. We did a lot of problematic things in the world, but there was a sense that we weren't supposed to be that way. And moreover, we weren't supposed to make it easy for others to be that way, right? So I think that's part of, part of it. I think that, um, you know, um, when George Bush was president, because the Iraq War, a lot of people argued that you know he, he had damaged America's reputation, and when Obama came in, he would restore America's reputation. What we actually saw was that having a negative reputation hurts you, but having a positive reputation doesn't give you that much leverage, right? I mean, Obama couldn't get the Pakistanis to tell us where Bin Laden was, and he couldn't get the Israelis to be serious about peace, and he couldn't get the Saudis to not go into Yemen. So I think, but I think the notion that you do stand for something that even if it's imperfect is more about values, you know, it, it is very important. And, um, uh, but it's also the notion that I'd, I'd love to have other world leaders <coughs> emerge who have this soft power, as it's called, uh, it shouldn't be about us. Uh, we're not up to it, and it's a diverse enough world where it, you know, a UN Secretary General who could be a secular pope like Hammarskjöld. Those are those are a lot of the kind of things we need as part of the mix. Um, my question relates to the um, to the changing character of um, threats and mass destruction. And, uh, it's okay. and the mitigation. And so reflecting on weapons of mass destruction, really that was a matter that was in the hands of a handful of state actors. But when you look at global disease and climate change, they're really matters that touch on state actors around the world, all states, and many interests within those states. So uh, the Trump administration, or President Trump very much turned resiled from multilateralism. What prospects do you see for a return to multilateralism under a future administration of either color? Sure. So again, to be fair, you know, the Paris Accord, while it was an achievement, two things about it, what very few countries have lived up to their commitments, not just us, so we can't just say, and secondly, best case scenario for Paris Accord was it wasn't going to do enough to solve the, the global warming problem. So again, not just Trump. He's made it worse, but not just Trump. Um, my view on multilateralism with both my colleagues in the academic world and others is, is a tough love approach. And if we really believe, and, and various versions of multilateralism, some of it's about the UN, some of it's within regions, some of it's about small circles of states. Um, but if we believe we need this kind of cooperation, 
you know, let's not just say it's a good thing, let's figure out how to make it work better and be honest about what the problems and flaws are and figure out ways to address that. You know, on the question of threats, so right, so you know, nuclear weapons, we've always had this image, right? The Hiroshima or the tests here in the South Pacific or the On the Beach movie or other movies that were made in the 1980. Um, you know, what's happened in your country this year and we've had it in our country too. Most scientists, meteorologists say that it's not so much that we have more hurricanes and storms, it's the severity of them. And that the effects, you know, if you take a magazine in the real estate in or the insurance industry about climate change, it sounds like Al Gore, right? Because they get it. They're going to lose all these properties they have on the coast. Um, and so I, I think that, but the reality that, you know, it did get quite a bit of publicity. We were obviously paying more attention to we were coming. You know, if there's any doubt that climate change is here and now, um, with all that this country's gone through, I think it made the case stronger than it has been. And so there's something to work with there. And, you know, communication specialists can figure out what the right image is, how you market this politically. Um, and that's where I think that the COVID-19, you know, Ebola and Zika were kind of over there. Even SARS was sort of didn't affect the world as much, but, you know, all over the world. I mean, look what's happening in Italy now. Um, and um, it's happening in the United <coughs> States. Universities are being closed. Uh, the notion that, wow, you know, this is something, you know, that is real and now and can be as disruptive not as nuclear weapons, but as a whole lot of weaponry. I think there, there's things for people to work with. Can I go back to when Albert was a senator and he was writing his first book and those of us, you know, around him was, you know, he seemed to be interested in it, but, you know, people would, you know, make, make, make small of it and stuff. So I feel like there's a lot to work with and I know I have some sense for the debate in this country and of course the coal industry and everything, but this economic win-win is there to be worked with and I think that case has to be made uh, and it can be made in a tangible short-term way as well as a longer-term way. Okay, last question. Bruce, I want to go back to the longer term drivers theme that you picked up and pick, pick up on the last question but also some comments from Evelyn. You said the United States remains the most powerful country uh, in the world, granted. And that matters for the second and third thing I want to come back to. But the reality seems to be that over several years, if not decades, the US capacity to disrupt, damage, degrade, destroy, defeat remains unrivaled and unchallengeable. But the capacity to create, protect, preserve has gradually waned. And you express this in different forms yourself. And that's a long-term trend which leaves us with a leadership vacuum uh, which even if there is a change of administration and vision is going to remain. And that matters because of the second and third factors. We are at a stage where multilateralism is more necessary than ever, and yet the institutions of multilateralism and the effectiveness of multilateralism are crumbling and going down. Again, for a number of structural reasons as well as others, I'll just mention two. One, the climate change and the coronavirus are good examples, and that is that problems arise with the speed and rapidity and spread with the speed and rapidity completely out of the capacity of institutions to respond in a timely manner. And I don't see a solution to that, and I think that is going to accelerate, picking up the phrase that Evelyn used. Uh, and the second, exa second example in global governance is that the distri distribution of authority in the dis decision-making structures of the multilateral order is increasingly out of alignment with the distribution of economic, diplomatic, military power in the real world. And that undermines the effectiveness and legitimacy and results that follow them. So that's the second thing. And the third thing, and probably the most important from my point of view, for reasons you'll understand or you know, is that the, pretty much all the big problems we face are global in scope and require global efforts collaboratively to resolve them and address them. But the locus of authority for making decisions 
and mobilizing resources coercively if necessary is still at the state level. And that disjuncture is simply not sustainable for our survival. So, um, Ramesh, I'm, you know, I agree with your analysis and, you know, you've worked throughout your career on, on trying to make multilateralism more effective. Um, and I, you know, agree on your sort of more pessimistic sense of the prospects for progress, right? Um, I'm from New York, so I couldn't possibly be naive, right? Um, but then the question is, okay, how do we do as well as we can, right? And I think that a couple of things. One, that's why this notion of trying to figure out how to make multilateralism in various forms more effective is absolutely crucial. Second is to think about it. I mean, if you look at global public health, you know, the second largest budget for global public health in the world is the Gates Foundation. Now, again, they're critics, but so the role of non-state actors doesn't supplant the state, but they're part of the mix. Or as the genocide was becoming more apparent in Myanmar with Rohingya, who was calling attention to it? Even before the UN did, it was journalists and human rights groups that now had satellite technology that could see it that only states used to have. So a lot of actors are there, um, uh, and I know what you're saying. I mean, it goes back to you know UN Security Council expansion and a variety of other things and, and the importance of that. But I, I sort of feel like it's a um, you know almost like a geopolitical marketplace where where progress is going to come from a variety of different sectors with this notion of you know of comparative advantage. And as far as the U.S.'s role, you're right. I mean, in some ways, you know, and I think it's true of China too. We can do more to make problems for the world than to run it. I think it's true, but I think China's beginning to run into pushbacks. Belt Road Initiative, oh, so, you know, you don't have human rights or environmental standards, but wait a second, you know, if you're trying to run things here, we had the European colonialists, we had the Americans and the Soviets, we don't necessarily want that. So I think any major power that overreaches runs into a bit, uh, you know, a certain amount of pushback. And, and so, you know, the U.S. share of global power, maybe it was 50, 51 plus percent in a certain era, it will never be that. I don't think China's will be that either. Maybe it's a plurality now, call it, put a number at 35%, 37 I think it's a larger share going forward than others. If we um, deplete it by our actions, you know, it gets to be less and less. Uh, so that's why I say it's not just going to be about what the next administration does and others. Um, a, we can stop making it worse. B, we can figure out, the, I think the Iran deal 2015 was one because of our you know, particular relationship with Iran, we were the crucial actor there to bring others together, and there will probably be other issues. It used to be that way in the, in the Arab-Israeli conflict. I don't think it is anymore. Um, so that's what I mean, I, what, when I think we'll be the, the single most powerful force in the world, but nothing like it used to be, and it's not a chess-beating thing. It's more how do we use that for ways, and how do we understand that in some situations other countries and other actors will lead one of them. Last point, I think, is that when we need multilateralism, I, I still believe it, it's a little bit about the environmental issue. You know, the state remains the crucial actor in the international system, and I don't see that changing. Its relative role vis-a-vis non-state actors is less than it was. But the whole Paris Accord was based upon national policies. And so if we can have a better policy that demonstrates that we are doing more for renewables in our country, we have to do that as well as be part of, of global agreements. So it's kind of all of the above. Uh, that, that has to be part of it. I mean, maybe it would be a great world if we could find one benevolent country that would run it for us, but probably won't stay benevolent, and that's not going to happen. So that's, anyway, my sense of, of what our role is and where it fits with others. Okay, on that note, um, Bruce, I'd like, on behalf of everyone here, to thank you for a, a really terrific uh, talk tonight, and I'm a relentless note taker, and I've taken lots thank of you. notes. Uh, so if you could all join me in thanking Bruce. Thank you. And thank you for your questions.